Scanning the globe. It's World Affairs Roundup. The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents World Affairs Roundup, a monthly edition of International Focus, providing opinion and analysis of global events, with John Kotzka, a retired member of the U.S. Foreign Service, Anne Hamilton, political scientist at UW-Whitewater, who also served in the U.S. Foreign Service, and Robert Craig, executive director of Citizen Action of Wisconsin and author of articles and books on American foreign policy. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now, here's your moderator, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus and this season's final edition of our World Affairs Roundup. During his trip to Asia last month, President Obama was asked about his administration's approach to foreign policy. He responded by saying that it may not be sexy, but it avoids errors. He went on to offer a baseball metaphor, saying, quote, you hit singles, you hit doubles, every once in a while we may be able to hit a home run, but we steadily advance the interests of the American people and our partnership with folks around the world, close quotes. Before taking a well-earned summer break, our Roundup regulars are here to reflect on past and present perceptions of key American interests and offer some thoughts on current policies designed to promote them. As we survey U.S. actions in Ukraine, Syria, Iran, China, and elsewhere, can we discern a coherent Obama doctrine? Or, like his critics, are we compelled to ask, are we adrift? Well, welcome back, everyone. Good of you to take time before heading off to your palatial summer estates. <laughs> so uh, I'd like to start, if I could, just uh, with a look back at... Uh, sort of mid-20th century, and uh, Walter Lippmann, George Kennan, folks like that, really boiled American interests down to a few key factors. And as you see here, no enemy beachhead in the Americas, no enemy domination of Europe, no adversary shutting the U.S. out of East Asia, and no adversary denying U.S. access to Mideast oil. So what about that? I mean, did that actually work as an organizing principle? I think, I think basically it's still working uh, with a couple of modifications, but I would even add to it. I would say that since World War II, we had a strategic goal of providing stability in the world. With the, with the, after the beginning of the Cold War and Kennan's doctrines, uh, we began to expand that with the ideological overhang of combating communism, but stability was still underwriting underneath that to build markets to, to improve prosperity for everyone. Well, uh, let's take a, a look at uh, Kennan, since you reference him. And, uh, of course, he's, he's known for the, uh, the strategy of containment. But he, he says, in uh, 1947, our opposition to communist expansion is not an absolute factor. Containment must be taken in relation to American security and American objectives. Uh, good realist. So what about that? I mean, uh, you know, we see Kennan, who is, is, you know, renowned for his skepticism of the expansion of communism, saying, yes, but there are exceptions. Talk a little bit about that, Anne. Well, it quickly evolved into something else. I mean, in the sense that during the Cold War, you certainly saw um, instances, well, Vietnam is one instance. Um, later in the Cold War, we certainly going into Africa and fighting proxy wars there, um, it was the U.S. supporting one liberation movement against liberation movements that were supported by the Russians, uh, the Soviets, I'm sorry, and the Chinese. Um, so we were fighting communism all over the world well until the end of the Cold War. And of course, we had Cuba in our own backyard, which violated the first premise up there that, that Kennan had, had indicated. But, you know, what about this? I mean, is, is it possible, Robert, to, to maintain that sort of short list of strategic interests in, in, as a matter of practice? 
Well, I don't think we did as a matter of practice. I mean, the Ken and Lippmann doctrine would not have underwritten the Vietnam War, for example, and certainly not the Iraq War, just to give two bookend examples. And so we've been, we've, I think we've been adrift of strategy uh, since the end of the Cold War. At least the Cold War provided a more organizing principle, though Ken and limited, as you pointed out, to national security interests and containment, not just containment period, which we lost sight of. But after uh, the Cold War finally ended, uh, there was a lot of talk of post-Cold War internationalism, a new kind of foreign policy realism that would include idealism, and that really hasn't materialized. And so instead, we have, we've had the Bush doctrine, which was kind of reinvent the Cold War with new enemies, and now we have Obama, if the Obama doctrine is anything, it's cut the cut the middle, just tread the middle, be tough but not too tough, and uh, don't get involved in any major wars and, and, and wind down the ones you inherited. I think it's unfair to, to castigate this administration or even the other administration since the end of the Cold War because we haven't come up with a clear understanding, a commonly held understanding of what kind of world we're looking for, what are, what are the, what, what's the recipe for dealing with it, uh, and that's still evolving. So I, adrift, yes, but I don't think it is necessarily the responsibility of this administration. Well, you know, what about uh, the impact of at least the perception of a monolithic adversary, like the Cold War era? I mean, how does that influence any administration's ability to sort of stick to those core strategic interests and principles? I mean, is, is it a lot harder when, when there's no Soviet Union? Well, if we think back to Samuel Huntington's Clash of Civilizations, you know, he argued in 1993 that we would no longer have the ideological conflict because the Cold War was over, and but we would be having this conflict between civilizations. And a lot of people returned to that after 9-11 to say that, well, now it was called the War on Terror, but he said the biggest fault line would be t between the West and all the rest, and he said the worst conflicts would be between Islam and the West. Now, of course, that cannot be an organizing principle of American foreign policy. Um, it just can't be. Um, these are ideas. They're not states. They're very amorphous. Uh, you, there's the conflation of Islam with terrorism, which is terribly problematic. Um, but I think that if you look at recent, you know, sort of, this is a, an idea that you do see um, throughout foreign policy, particularly since 9-11, since um, but it's not an organizing principle. Right, you can't really declare war against an emotion. I mean, the war on terror did not does not work as well, an organizing you know principle. You win? Right, you don't. And you know the the yeah. alleged source of terror, Al Qaeda, which obviously was the source of 911, is not in Afghanistan. hasn't been for a long time, but we're still having a war on terror there. You see, so it it doesn't make sense. And part of the problem is the frame. Once you frame it, you decide who the evildoers are, and you have a war on them. Then outside of the frame is, say, all the Iraqi casualties, for example, from the Iraq war, or the incredible repercussions ongoing as far as a completely dysfunctional and broken country, sure. for example. So, but I think John's right. I don't disagree with him about the idea that maybe not an individual administration's responsibility to devise the whole grand strategy, but we lack one. And we need to be thinking about America's power declining relative to the rest of the world. And uh, we talk, talking about um, pulling back on major social commitments like Medicare and Social Security at the same time that we kind of blindly march forward with this very large forward force posture around the world. There needs to be a broader step back and it needs to include domestic policy as well and America's place in the world and what role it should play in that world. Robert Kaplan, who's written a number of books on foreign policy, as, as well as being the chief advisor uh, analyst for Stratfor, a private intelligence organization, uh, has comes up with a slightly different way of looking at the world as it's evolving. Uh, he see reg regional hegemons who, like China in Asia, Russia in that part of the world, Germany in Europe, Brazil, in Latin America being uh, sort of the, the gatekeepers for those particular regions. The problem is not all of these are capable of dealing with, th with that concept yet, and there's lots of inherent issues at play in all of these countries, but where does that put the United States in this process? And that's evolving as well. Not only are we, are we constricted by a, a public which is not particularly enthused about getting involved internationally, our, our bank is broke 
I mean, we're broke in that respect. Well, you know, let's let's move forward in time a bit. I mean, uh, clearly the the end of the Cold War and the breakup of the Soviet Union was sort of a seminal moment. And here's a, a quote from Anthony Lake, the National Security Advisor, uh, in uh, 1993, saying the su successor to the doctrine of containment must be a strategy of enlargement, enlargement of the world's free community of market e or democracies. And then taking that a bit further, a few years later, was uh, the Project for a New American Century, uh, William Crystal's uh, project, in which he says, and the emphasis is mine here, global leadership is not something exercised at our leisure when the mood strikes us or when our core national security interests are directly threatened, then it's already too late. Rather, it's a choice whether or not to maintain American military preeminence, to secure American geopolitical leadership, and to preserve the American peace. And a bit later in that same document, he says, the history of the 20th century should have taught us that it's important to shape circumstances before crises emerge and to meet threats before they become dire. The history of the past century should have taught us to embrace the cause of American leadership. If we are adrift as in a foreign policy, it's because we not look at any of these particular issues in terms of options, consequences, and costs. Mm -hmm. uh, we rhetorically respond as we're doing in Ukraine, as we did in Libya, as we're doing as we did in Syria, rather than thinking through and coming up with a policy and then communicating that to the American people. Well, what about this this notion that you know? Uh, American leadership is is essential to the world, and that should be the frame through which our, our foreign policy is mediated. Is that workable? Again, the problem here is what what is American leadership? It's it's very subjective, and it means one thing to one person, another thing to people abroad, and certainly very many different things to Americans. So it doesn't help us decide what our foreign policy should look like. And one of the things I, I agree that we, we haven't looked at different options and all. We also don't spend time pri establishing priorities, which is mm -hmm. most important. And how do our foreign policy goals relate to domestic goals? I remember being very struck uh, right after Obama had, the health care bill had passed and the Europeans being very upset because they said he had spent all his political capital on the health care bill, and, which meant that they weren't going to get any agreement on global warming. And um, and right. and that is probably true, but that was not an that was not a, a part of the debate in the United States, and it has, it hasn't been seen in terms of priorities and the world looks options. at our debates as part of their debates, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that yeah. with negative and positive con uh, yeah. connotations as well. Well, we're uh, we're about uh, to bump up against our break, but when we come back, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the sort of the specific foreign policy environment we're in just now. Uh, and I'll, I'll set that up with a, a recent quote by one of uh, the president's critics who said, if Ronald Reagan's foreign policy doctrine was peace through strength, Obama's doctrine can be summed up in two sentences, speak loudly and carry no stick, and be good to your enemies and bad to your allies. So with that, we'll take a short break and uh, be back with more World Affairs Roundup. <laughs> The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back to International Focus and our World Affairs Roundup, where we're trying to discern the existence or not of an Obama doctrine. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, first of all, let's let's take a look back at uh, at the Kennan and Lippmann era, where you could boil down the sort of core U.S. interests to to those few bullet points. Is that possible these days? It would require a complete rethinking of what our priorities are, which we haven't undertaken. Obviously, coming out of World War II, that was a time in brand new world with two superpowers. That was a time for thinking at the highest level. 
and we haven't really returned to that. And Anne is absolutely right, it has to be related to domestic policy. Uh, the issue is, John mentioned the, the country being broke. The country is richer than it was during the Cold War. Uh, we're just much more dysfunctional as far as how we <laughs> distribute resources. And so, and quite frankly, the big difference since 1973 has been economic insecurity, which has defined our country domestically since then. And so that should be related to our foreign policy. Our foreign policy should seek to create more economic security for the American people. One way to do that, of course, is to provide it for a lot of people around the world, not just see it in jingoistic American terms, and to think about how an American or global economy could create more, uh, larger middle class, more stability, more, uh, quite frankly, for average people. And we're not, we're not making those connections. Instead, I think John and Ann are absolutely right. We just go crisis to crisis. And we don't even look at the connection between those crises, so in terms of priorities. In other words, Obama's attacked in each one independently without relation to the others in the news cycle. As unaccustomed as I am to disagree with Robert, <laughs> every year the State Department comes up with a set of pillars, the foreign policy pillars, the promotion of democracy, the respect for human rights. We have a whole number of those. I don't know what they are currently, but part of it is something Ann talked about, priorities, because we're almost assigning equal priority to these things. We came out of the Cold War and one of the things that happened was very wonderful. Eastern and Central Europe, depending upon how they want to call it, embraced democracy. They were waiting for it to happen. And we took that as, an in, as, as a license then to be able to go to the rest of the world and say, it's here. But if anything I've learned over my career is you can, you can import democracy, but you can't export it. And we just haven't got that message. And so our priorities are not in order. I think we're, we're, we're covering all the bases. We're just not looking at them in the same way. We, we're assigning human rights to equal value to our national interests in a particular area. So what's changed? I mean, how was it that in an earlier era, say in, in President Truman's administration, it was much more easy to, to boil down what our strategic interests were and have widespread agreement on it in the policymaking community. I mean, what, why is that not done now? I think that one of the major issues there was the, the realization that we are, we're now in the nuclear era. And it seemed that those stakes were very, very clear early on, given that we had, you know, used the, the, the weapon um, in Japan. We knew that for the first time, the two superpowers had these awesome weapons that could wipe us out in minutes. And I think that that became an organizing principle very quickly. Um, and I also think, of course, with the, the media, the role of the media now, technology and all, we're dealing with a lot more information spin um, and a, a much larger group that at least gets information on foreign policy. I mean, there, the, it seems that there's no longer the small foreign policy elite that controls it all and the rest of the public doesn't care. Um, it, it seems much more complicated than that. Let me get a little spin on that. Uh, look at that information communication flow and look at it in terms of who can get all that information. A few policymakers in Washington now have instant information about everywhere in the world. They're making decisions now on the basis of Every, every event, going back to Yugoslavia, when all those decisions were being made in Washington, to what we're doing in Syria, there's no input from the field anymore other than to be able to carry messages between the governments. So is this an example of sort of analysis paralysis? Do we just have so much information that it's hard to, to boil it down to a few key principles that animate our policies? Or, or, or I'm comfortable enough with all the information I have and I don't need any more. Mm -hmm. That probably does cause a, a kind of attention deficit disorder, <laughs> uh, which is characteristic <laughs> of the modern media age, and that's combined with a lack of a strategy that we're in, like you use on principle to prioritize with. Um, remember, we came out of World War II, that was an era of fear, right? Fear of the Depression, fear of fascism, and now fear of nuclear weapons and another superpower that for a time under Stalin seemed like an aggressive imperialistic superpower, though I would say by the mid-50s it was clear they were a status quo power, but it wasn't clear immediately after the war. And so it's very, that level of fear, we, we think we're afraid of terrorists. It's not the same level of fear 
Um, and, so, and so that's why you could have the height of the Iraq war where there was really a frenzy for maybe a year or two, and then it died down and President Bush got clobbered in the 2006 midterm elections in part because he could not wave the bloody flag anymore and it, it had worn out. Well, and let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, uh, what what is the mood of the electorate right now? I'm, I'm thinking of Daniel Dresner, who wrote something in Foreign Policy a few years ago, mentioning that America's 20-something foundational foreign policy experiences have basically been September 11, two long wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and a giant international recession, and the slow ascent of China. I mean, what what does this do to the people's appetites for intervention towards anything? And what, what is the sort of floor political reality in which the Obama administration is conducting foreign policy? The American people want the government to go on a diet. <laughs> they, there's no, been no case made to them as to why we should be involved in any major wars. Uh, and so, and then you're being asked to make, to, to make all sorts of choices, whether we can afford to have first class schools, other things that actually do relate, direct, re, directly relate to our power, quite frankly, if you think about it. You have, to, you have to combine these issues. And so, aside from a direct threat to the mainland, another 911 kind of situation, right, it's, it, there, there isn't much popular appetite for it. But foreign policy is the one area, since it doesn't become the top issue in most elections, uh, the 2004 election being an exception, right, uh, where, where it can go along for a long time even without mass public support. And this, a lot of the appeal to the public is driven by emotion. I've been thinking lately about, especially with the, the kidnapping of the mm -hmm. girls in Nigeria and the American response and sending over special forces, and how would we explain that to the American public as being in our interests? I think a case probably could be made um, in terms of, I'm not sure, you know, but you could talk about it in terms of uh, national interest, what the, the, what the chaos that is happening in Nigeria could spread and lead to legitimate national security concerns. Um, and you can see certainly a lot of problems in the, that whole area of Africa. But instead, it's about the emotions of the girls being, which it's horrible, it's a horrible story. But n none of these stories sort of are explained in dispassionate terms as to why it's important for us to yeah. intervene or not intervene. And picking up on that, not only looking at whether or not this is something we should do, but then w how do we get out? What are the costs? Right. What are the consequences? If we do this, how is the Nigerian government going to respond? Obviously, we're going to try and get their cooperation. But are we looking at all of those relationships right. in Africa? What, what about other countries in Africa that have similar problems? Are we going to jump in every time? Right. Well, and so, so what about that? I mean, if, if a situation like th those abductions in, in uh, that particular instance occur, and there isn't a lens through which we, we can view it composed of these sort of core strategic principles, I mean, is a lot of it just driven by the news cycle? And, and but there is another, f we, we talked about it earlier uh, off camera, responsibility to protect which has become kind of a core principle for the State Department. And it's a driver. And that doesn't call, talk, take into consideration national interests or costs or consequences. It's you, we need to move sort of thing. And it becomes, it becomes, it, it, it gets the media going, it gets public opinion moving, but then all of a sudden we're there and we find out, well, what are we going to do next? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, uh, Sort of a, as we, we bump up against the end of the show, uh, Senator Bob Corker, who is the, the ranking Republican on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, had a critique of the administration's foreign policy in which he says, quote, on foreign policy, they cannot wait until January of 2017. All they wish to do is avoid confrontation at all costs. On every issue, it's the minimal, it's the minimal, it's the minimal. So is there anything to that? Is, is the goal at this point just not to make any bad mistakes? Some of that. Well, that would be implied by the singles hitting philosophy expressed yes. by the president on his Asian tour, right? But that assumes, I mean, why would you, why would you create big mistakes for no clear gain either, right? And, 
the president's crit critics just want to say in Congress that everything he's doing isn't aggressive enough and we have to have more testosterone, but without no strategy behind that either, other than being critical of the president and wanting to call him weak. There's, you're, we're assuming that there is unanimity on the part of the administration, mm -hmm. and if you right. look at the two, the two, the two uh, terms for the for the Obama administration, the first one was the foreign policy was was led by Gates, uh, Hillary Clinton, and and uh, I think it was O'Donnell at the at the NSC, and that was much more realistically looking. The new one with Samantha Powers and Susan Rice. And uh, I'm not sure Kerry's in that mix. Well, <laughs> well uh, we've got just about a minute left. And I thought uh, before we what, depart, what are you going to do? Tom? Our, uh, our audience may be interested in uh, <laughs> how our panel is spending their summer. So, John, I understand that uh, your plan uh, includes a, a fishing trip with a friend. And cer certainly, I hope uh, you'll be sending us a postcard. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, dear. <laughs> Uh, Anne, I know you spend a fair amount of time in Latin America, and we're not quite sure what you're doing down there. But, uh -oh. but if you were able to go again, I hope you send one of those T-shirts that have gotten so popular. <laughs> <laughs> and Robert, I was very impressed to learn that uh, you're taking time off from your usual responsibilities to serve as a summer intern in one of our leading companies. So I, I hope uh, things go well for you. <laughs> oh my God! Oh, okay, yes. I gotta make a poster out of that one. <laughs> and to our viewers. Enjoy the encore editions of our shows over the summer, and we'll see you in September. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220, or visit us at our website, 